Good morning to all joining from the US and good evening to all that are joining from Asia. My name is Aditi Modi and I am the Executive Director at the University of Chicago Center in India. I hope all of you are keeping safe and healthy in this turbulent time. It is heartening and amazing to see such a great turnout for today's topical webinar, COVID-19 and Health Disparities, Protecting Our Most Vulnerable Populations. Today's webinar will feature medical faculty at the University of Chicago's Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence and is being held in partnership with the University of Chicago Center in Beijing and the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Ruan campus in Hong Kong. The University of Chicago, as many of you might be aware, has a long history of eminence in the sciences and this has been furthered in recent years by significant growth in faculty and research, especially in the medical sciences and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence is one such example. The Institute's mission is to improve patient care, strengthen doctor-patient relationships, and enhance communication and decision-making through research and education programs and reduce healthcare disparities. Our centers in Beijing, Delhi, and the France and Rouen campus in Hong Kong have become a hub for the University of Chicago's community in Asia, and their presence has allowed the University of Chicago faculty to establish long-term relationships with partners in the region, resulting in a constant stream of contact and collaboration. The format of today's webinar will be that each of our eminent panelists will speak for a few minutes, and then this will be followed by a panel discussion that will be moderated by my colleague Mark Panico, the executive director at our Hong Kong campus. A brief introduction to our eminent panelists before I invite them on the screen. Our first speaker is Marshall Chin. He is a Richard Parello Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics at the Department of Medicine and the Associate Chief and Director of Research, uh, the Section of Internal Medicine and Associate Director at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. Dr. Chin has been working to ensure equity across all areas of the healthcare system and currently is part of a few coalition efforts by foundations, agencies, and patient consumer advocacy groups to influence the short and long-term health and social policies impacted by COVID-19. And today he will speak on the healthcare systems and policies and how they are and are not addressing the vulnerable populations with COVID-19. Albert Huang is our next speaker after Dr. Chin, and he's a professor of medicine, director at the, of the Center for Chronic Disease Research and Policy, and associate director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research at the University of Chicago. Dr. Huang is a former senior advisor in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, Department of Health and Human Services, and over the past decade has established one of the most active research programs in geriatric diabetes in the US. And today he will speak on the implications of COVID-19 for older patients. He will be followed by Dr. Monica P, who is the Associate Professor for Medicine and Associate Director at the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research and Associate Director at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. She will address on issues that are related to racial and ethical minorities, as she has been studying racial health disparities even before the outbreak of the coronavirus, and her research is now more important than ever. Dr. Peake has advised both the University of Chicago and the state of Illinois on the allocation of scarce resources, for example, ventilators, and has also been inspired, uh, appointed, sorry, to the city of Chicago's racial equity rapid response workforce to address racial disparities in COVID-19 mortality. Our final speaker will be Satinder Singh, who is Associate Professor for Physiology at the University College of Medical Sciences, University of Delhi, and an executive member of the Ethics Committee of the Delhi Medical Council. Dr. Singh is a noted disability rights activist, and he recently spearheaded the framing of disability competencies in India for health professions to improve doctor-patient relationships. He is also working on supportive decision-making among marginalized populations, especially people with disabilities. And today, you will hear from him on issues related to disabled patients and COVID-19. Thank you all again for joining us this evening and morning. And with that, I will request our first speaker, Dr. Chin, to provide his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Aditi. I'm going to cover how the U.S. has addressed the COVID-19 situation covering both successes and challenges with lessons and issues that are generalizable to other countries. I'm gonna divide my remarks into four stages of the pandemic. First is what I would call the public health stage where we try to identify cases of COVID-19 and then contain the virus 
using the principles of good infectious disease public health. Identifying cases, isolating that individual, contacting the, the people who have been in contact with that particular person, and then isolating those who have also been infected. In the US, the first case was found in the middle of January on the west coast of the country in the state of Washington. And the US has had two major problems around that particular issue. First is that the national government was slow to take the pandemic seriously. President Trump had previously eliminated a global pandemic office in his national security office, which was designed to plan for pandemics. He also was slow to take the concerns of his advisors seriously about the pandemic. And then finally, it took until March 13th, two months into the issue in the US before President Trump declared a national emergency. Second, there was early on an inadequate supply of COVID-19 testing materials. The Centers for Disease Control had created the initial test and it was faulty. The Food and Drug Administration, which is the part of the federal government that oversees and regulates private laboratories, was overly restrictive and bureaucratic in its initial dealings with the private laboratories. And the federal government was unwilling to step in and to address and fix the problems with the supply of materials for COVID-19 testing. The end result was that because of few tests available, there was overly restrictive criteria on who would be able to receive a test. I remember, for example, at the University of Chicago, like many different hospitals, the initial criteria were that you had to have recently been in China or in Wuhan as a major risk factor. Other people were not tested. The result that because not enough people were tested, COVID-19 spread rapidly throughout the country. And so the initial public health methods of being able to do case identification and contact tracing really were not possible because the virus has spread too far. And therefore, the country entered a mitigation strategy phase, social distancing six feet between people. The second phase of the pandemic I would call the stress to the healthcare system, where COVID-19 patients are going to clinics and hospitals. And here you might think of multiple levels of key stakeholders. You have the front line, the healthcare providers, clinics, and hospitals. You have cities, you have the 50 states, and you have the federal government. The front line has been heroic, that the doctors, nurses, frontline responders have done an outstanding job. At the level of large cities, many of the city, large city gov uh, mayors, such as the state or city of, of New York City, they have also been aggressive with their public health measures, doing the social distancing, trying to find adequate supplies like ventilators and protective equipment for, for personnel. The level of 50 states, you've seen great variability among the response among the governors. And also among the federal government, there's been a, a variable response. The third level I would call uh, is the current evolving situation for the pandemic, where one of the key issues has been tensions uh, between science and uh, medicine, and then the interests of the economy and businesses and political considerations. From a scientific perspective, the concern is then spread of the virus. And so still uh, a major push for social distancing. On the other hand, the shutting down the economy has caused great harm to people also economically, as well as spillover effects into to health. And there's a great push then from the business and economic community to open up the country. We also in a, a complicated situation where this is an election year in the United States. So there are additional political considerations. And so we then have then the situation then where we are trying to balance then issues of science and then issues of then the politics. <clears throat> the fourth issue I would uh, mention is then the emergency phase, emergency relief phase, where we have in general been funding the status quo as opposed to trying to uh, address some of the more fundamental social drivers of inequities. Much of the direct funding has gone towards uh, uh, immediately to healthcare institutions like hospitals, to businesses, and to the public, as opposed to doing a more fundamental reform of the system, such as expanding health insurance coverage for the different parts of the country. So overall, I would mention that we have uh, five overall lessons to share. First, that honesty and transparency with the public are incredibly important if we're going to have faith in the system. and a unified national response. Second is that it's critical to ensure that there's an adequate public health infrastructure 
for doing things like identification cases and contact tracing, as well as it's critical to have an adequate safety net for the overall population. Third, there's a role for both central control. So for example, in the United States, there, there should be a role then for the national government ensuring that there's an adequate supply of COVID-19 tests or an adequate supply of ventilators or an adequate supply of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. At the same time, there is a role for decentralization. So for example, the issue of like when to open up businesses uh, so that uh, the, the, the economy can start uh, flourishing again, um, that might need to be done at a local level. So for example, some rural areas of the country have relatively less cases of COVID-19 than the urban areas. Fourth is that science and evidence matter, that of course there are economic considerations, there are political considerations, but you can't fool mother nature. So ultimately, what is good for the, the, the health of the public and what's good for the economy is controlling this coronavirus. Then finally, and fifth, leadership matters. That in the United States, we've had many examples of both outstanding leadership as well as poor leadership. And it matters in a, any situation, particularly in our current situation of COVID-19. So thank you very much, and I'll come back for discussion. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Albert Huang. Um, thank you, Marshall, for that um, overview of the history and uh, policies related to COVID-19. I'm going to be talking to you about a particular uh, vulnerable population that has been deeply affected by the pandemic, which are people that are older. So throughout the world, in every country, um, the oldest in every, every country has unfortunately uh, been the subgroup that has suffered the most from uh, COVID-19. In, uh, in particular, older adults who are dependent on others living in long-term care facilities have experienced um, uh, uh, tra tragic levels of morbidity and mortality. In some parts of the world, 50% uh, of deaths have happened among older people living in long-term care. So, um, and this is not you know, limited to um, one country. As Dr. Chin mentioned, the first outbreak in the United States was actually in long-term care facilities in, in outside of Seattle, but we've had recurring report and ongoing reports of high rates of death um, in long-term care in Spain, the United Kingdom. Um, there are ongoing tragic reports of people finding um, uh, dead bodies in long-term care facilities. And what the pandemic has done is it's revealed some of the deficiencies of the social net safety net that is related to long-term care throughout the world in different countries, even in countries where um, long-term care systems are fairly robust and well-funded. And um, so I'll talk about the problems and challenges, why that death rate has been so high, why this population has been so vulnerable, and talk about some immediate short-term actions that, um, that that countries could take and then what it means long-term for the social safety net for older people. So the complex issue around care of older people is that many are not fully independent. And so many rely on a social network of individuals to support help with daily tasks of live, daily living, such as shopping and driving, um, even more basic tasks such as bathing and dressing. And so in normal times, um, these individuals need the support of this network to remain healthy. But this very network is also what creates the vulnerability to pandemic infection. Um, so if one is dependent on others and um, the support net anybody in the support network develops an infection, this can lead to rapid spread of infection among people uh, that are cared for. If a key member of the support network becomes sick or must go into quarantine, the older adult will then have to find alternative forms of support for the care that they received. Um, and so this duality of the network, the network is both supportive, but it's also a risk. And that um, illustrates the, the, the twin risks that are associated with uh, this uh, vulnerable older population. 
So this risk related to the social, the need for a network is really encapsulated within uh, long-term care facilities where really the most frail and vulnerable of older adults reside in concentrated populations. Long-term care throughout the world is at different stages of development. Some countries are just developing long-term care systems of insurance and, um, and long-term care industries. Um, others are much more mature with well-established long-term care facilities and um, different levels of regulation around the quality of care de de uh, uh, delivered in, long in these facilities. Um, historically, I'll just give a story in the United States, uh, these facilities have been understaffed and this situation has worsened um, uh, during the pandemic as sometimes uh, nurses and other staff have been deployed to other clinical settings. Um, and long-term care includes everything from assisted living where people are relatively independent to acute rehabilitation to actually long-term care nursing, which we imagine, uh, which is what is provided for people with uh, conditions like dementia. That the number, the outcome that is typically used to think about uh, staffing it, it, uh, support within facilities is the staff to patient ratio. And um, in general, there have been complaints about these ratios being out of balance, uh, where there are just not enough staff to care for individual patients. The, the lower this ratio is, the higher risk of a single staff member who's infected to spread the infection to uh, multiple patients. So what's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic in routine care is that staff, if they are following uh, social distancing policies and, and have to wear protective gear, they are slower to respond to the concerns and needs of, um, uh, of, their, of their patients. So for example, if a patient has diabetes, uh, the frequency of glucose monitoring um, may go down and there is an increased risk of missing um, side effects of, 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 the, of diabetes such as hypoglycemia. Um, so in, um, uh, I would also add that long-term care facilities that are uh, attempting to enforce uh, social distancing have also had to do things that uh, may have affected the, uh, the long-term mental health of their patients. So many patients have now been forced to go into their individual rooms. Um, they have been barred from seeing their family members. Um, and so this raises concerns about whether or not the reaction to the pandemic may lead to deterioration in mental health, um, where we lose the benefits of social contact with friends and family. So, um, um, so in addition to concerns about uh, potentially um, uh, under-managing chronic conditions that we cared for before, there's a concern about creating new forms of harm through social isolation, which we know is harmful uh, from prior research, uh, much of it done at the University of Chicago. So, I will um, just talk about a few things that um, can be done in the short term and what we think needs to be done in the long term. So in the short term, there's no doubt if countries have limited uh, resources for testing for COVID-19 and limited resources in terms of PPE, the long-term care setting is probably the place where you would want to devote those limited resources. In long-term cares where uh, many states and uh, and municipalities are devoting routine testing for COVID-19 among staff, certainly, and among patients. This is where you want to catch uh, an outbreak early and to uh, quarantine individuals who are infected as quickly as possible. This is the location where staff need to, to be taught and need to be provided PPE uh, in order to care, continue providing care for patients. Um, and um, there are also uh, creative ways of potentially reorganizing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the space of long-term care facilities where those who are infected are, uh, are uh, allocated to a special ward from those who are not, um, just as people are doing within hospitals. So these are some short-term maneuvers that uh, um, likely are, are happening already, but need to be uh, strengthened um, in order to prevent uh, more uh, outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Unfortunately, I think every day we continue to hear about these uh, outbreaks. For the future, um, I mean, I think the, I'll just go to this, the main point. We know that overall 
long-term care has been systematically underfunded. Um, in the United States, through a complex system of insurance, a lot of, a, a lot of healthcare in a long-term care is actually paid for through our Medicaid system. And our Medicaid system provides low rates of reimbursement for long-term care. This is probably at the root of why staffing is low in these facilities. Um, and so um, it may be that at, because of this pandemic, there's a, a revisiting of the amount of resources that go to long-term care via Medicaid. Um, and it's clear that going forward, uh, uh, there's going to be an increased emphasis on infection control and creating more strengthening regulations around infection control under different administrations. Um, there has been more intense focus on infection control, uh, for example, under Obama administration versus the Trump administration, and those will likely need to change. And there's likely also going to be a movement to see if we can take care of people more um, at home and not in long-term care facilities. Um, are there ways that we can increase um, funding and support for home care, uh, which, is the or which is the way we took care of older people for generations before? Uh, we may also be using, though, tech telehealth and technology that in ways that we did not in the past. So with that, um, I look forward to, to the discussion um, after the talks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wong and Dr. Chen for setting the stage of talking not only about uh, our healthcare system, but about um, vulnerable populations. So I'm gonna talk specifically about the case of African-American disparities in the United States, um, recognizing that this is a case study for a type of marginalized population that, um, represents uh, a population that has been exposed to structural inequities and that this uh, case study um, can be generalized to other populations within the United States and other populations um, across the globe. So it was about six weeks ago that um, we first heard uh, data around some of the racial disparities in the United States around the coronavirus. Um, and so in Chicago, we, um, where we have about a 30% prevalence, 30% uh, composition um, in our city of African Americans, uh, we learned that 72% of the deaths from coronavirus were among African Americans. And we were seeing similar numbers in New Orleans and Milwaukee. And that started um, a national uh, debate um, and a, it triggered other cities, municipalities and states to begin releasing data. Um, and so we've seen a national trend um, of these disparities between blacks and whites in not only coronavirus cases, but also coronavirus deaths uh, throughout the country. Um, and so what we have learned um, is that it's not a biological construct. There initially were concerns about um, differences in ARB receptors um, and other things, but uh, a lot of that has been put to rest. What we are finding is that it's the structural inequities um, that African Americans are disproportionately exposed to that appears to be driving um, a lot of the increased COVID um, mortality. And so there was a recent national analysis of county level data that came out last week that looked at um, different counties in the United States and found that the higher the proportion of African Americans in the county, the higher the uh, number of cases and the higher the number of deaths, and that these counties um, were more likely to be um, very crowded, physically crowded, um, to have lower scores for being able to socially isolate, uh, to have higher unemployment, to have uh, less um, health insurance, um, and to have other factors that we would have otherwise um, predicted to be associated um, with communities that have been historically marginalized. 
Um, and so I think what we can think about uh, some of the take home messages is we can sort of separate this into two different brackets. Um, one is the impact of structural inequities on access to healthcare um, and then non healthcare uh, mechanisms. And so for uh, the coronavirus, what that means uh, for um, marginalized populations like African Americans is that there is um, an increased uh, challenges with physically distancing. At the same time, there's a decreased ability to have physical ab barriers. So people have increased exposure, but less protection. Um, and so this is um, a double challenge. And so the sort of classic example that we've been discussing here in the United States is the challenge that we see for essential workers. So these are people who are allowing the rest of the country to safely shelter in place. Um, they're the ones that are keeping the pharmacies and grocery stores open, keeping public transit working, um, staffing our power plants so that the lights can stay on, um, all the critical functions that we need as a society to be able to um, stay at home. Those are disproportionately um, serviced by um, low income racial and ethnic minorities. So for um, example, in New York, which has been um, the city that has been hit most hard by the coronavirus, 70% of essential workers are persons of color. Um, and in that group of minorities, the largest subgroup is African Americans. And the essential workers are not being protected like healthcare workers. So even though they are working in crowded conditions, um, being exposed to the public, they don't have um, protective, personal protective equipment. And this gets back to what Dr. Chen was saying in that we um, missed the ball early on and we did not have enough supplies uh, for personal equ equipment. We didn't have enough supplies for testing. And so we have had to triage um, all of our the equipment that we do have. And so um, we've had to, understandably so, prioritize our healthcare workers, but we have a whole separate workforce who's being exposed to the coronavirus, who's not being protected. And as a result, um, those workers are disproportionately black and brown, disproportionately African-American, and they're getting sick at a higher rate. Um, and so that is a significant contributor um, to the increased cases and increased mortality um, seen within the African-American population. The other kinds of structural inequities have to do with uh, decreased uh, health insurance. Again, Dr. Chen had mentioned the need for us to sort of reopen the health insurance exchange within the United States with the Affordable Care Act and increase people's access um, to um, be able to have health insurance um, and for um, people to have just access, physical access to hospital systems. So some people are living in communities where there's not a nearby hospital or where their hospital is a community hospital that is not prepared uh, to take on heavy cases um, uh, for severe COVID where people need to be in the ICU. There may not be enough ventilators to adequately staff the demand that's coming from the community of people who are really sick with the coronavirus. And so uh, we see that there are, in some of the communities that have the highest need, um, shortages of testing supplies. There are different kinds of testing where there may be delays of five to seven days in getting the test results. Um, and compared to, for example, at the University of Chicago, where we can get our test results within hours. Um, there are differences in the kinds of care that large academic hospitals can provide that can't be provided in community hospitals because that's not what they're designed to do. And so the differential access of um, low-income communities to these kinds of care also impacts the mortality. Um, and the sort of the disease course once people become infected. And so there are a range of 
um, inputs um, that lead to a culmination of uh, disparities that we see amongst marginalized populations um, uh, who have historically and contemporarily been um, exposed to a range of structural inequities. And so that's what we're start seeing um, across the country. Um, the combination of historical injustice um, being played out with the current um, system of injustice sort of layered on top of that. And so what we're seeing is a number of cities and uh, states standing up and trying to address these issues. Again, Dr. Chen had mentioned in his last uh, comment about the importance of leadership um, and that we've seen some excellent, outstanding leadership and we've seen some leaders that have not stepped up to the plate. Um, and we've been lucky in that in New York, which has been a hot spot, that we've seen some outstanding leadership. And in Chicago, um, which is one of the first cities to note the significant disparities in coronavirus between blacks and whites, we've had outstanding leadership as well. And so some of the things that we've been doing here in the city have been to try and um, reverse or address many of the things that I was just mentioning. So to try and not just screen people who make their way into a hospital system with algorithms about comorbidities, but to try and um, begin screening um, in hotspot areas um, so that we're trying to do more public health prevention screening that we would like to have been able to do from the beginning with contact tracing. So we've identified uh, certain community areas where there's a significantly higher prevalence of COVID uh, cases and deaths and trying to do more universal screening in homeless shelters um, and congregate living like Dr. Uh, Wong was mentioning, where there's a lot of elderly and cases of mortality um, and trying to universally screen in those areas. Um, we're using community health workers to be out in the community. Um, our academic centers are sharing equipment, uh, sharing testing supplies, um, PPE and other things with our lower resourced hospitals. We have um, developed a triage protocol like a, a lot of ho uh, cities do for trauma so that uh, our safety net systems can directly go to some of the larger hospitals and uh, many of whom are academic hospitals um, and bring their uh, cases of coronavirus directly to those hospitals um, so that we're better able to meet the, the needs um, to, to balance the needs of uh, patient type and severity of illness with the capacity um, and skill set, um, the clinical uh, skill set, the, the infrastructure and the human capital of the hospital itself. And so there are a number of things um, that are happening uh, to try and uh, rebalance the uh, policies, structures, uh, infrastructure that's in place um, to reduce the disparities that we're seeing in Chicago. And so um, the city releases daily statistics around uh, mortality. And so six weeks ago, 72% uh, of the cases uh, for African-Americans, 72% uh, of the, the cases of COVID mortality were African-Americans. And a few days ago, it was 49%. And so we've made significant strides in a very short period of time, being able to implement um, real world uh, things that we can do today on the ground that don't require federal action. Um, and so, um, so those are just uh, some, some examples of recommendations that we're doing here in Chicago, but I underscore the um, underlying root causes of the problems for African-Americans and the universality of these issues um, across the globe. Um, and so, uh, so that's all I have to say for now about that. And I will I look forward to further discussion during the panel. Thank you, Dr. Peek. Good morning and good evening, depending on which part of the world you are in. Thanks to University of Chicago Global Centers and Buxbaum Institute for this opportunity. I am Dr. Satyendra Singh and I will be focusing on health disparities among disabled population. So disclosures up front, I'm a doctor with a disability. 
around 15% of the world's population live with some form of disability as per the World Health Organization. In that way, we are the world's largest minority. So how is this largest minority pairing with the COVID-19 impact? The 1.3 billion living with disabilities globally, which is equivalent to the current Indian population, they are no stranger to the kind of exclusion or lockdown imposed by the coronavirus on the rest of the population. Many of us living with a disability will not be able to go back to quote unquote business as usual uh, once the pandemic is over because 80% of disabled worldwide live in developing countries and 60 to 75% of these live in rural areas where they face multiple barriers. As of today, India has around 50,000 active cases and around 2,400 deaths, but we don't have any data on the number of disabled people affected or died because of COVID-19. Most of the time when reporters talk about COVID-19 preparedness, inadvertently the focus is on how the elderly and the disabled are more vulnerable. Despite our best attempts, it sends an unreasonable message that a few people's prosperity is more significant and it in a way devalues the lives of elderly and the disabled. However, we all know that viruses don't discriminate based on ageism or ableism and everybody, whether a person with disability or not can acquire this infection. In the state of Kerala in India, an elderly couple aged 93 and 88 years were infected and now they're completely recovered. A 106 year old gentleman recovered from COVID in the super specialty hospital, which is next to my workplace in Delhi. It is this inherent bias in the conventional health setup, which exacerbates health inequity and uses quote unquote quality of life and social worth as indicators in triage protocols in the pandemic. Mm. There were some disturbing reports from the four states in the United States suggesting that medical rationing programs were discriminating about people with intellectual disabilities, advanced neuromuscular disease, cystic fibrosis, and traumatic brain injury. This was termed as ICU eugenics by a disability activist in the US who got united under the hashtag, nobody is disposable. Accordingly, Office for Civil Rights of the United States Department of Health had to give a release on 28th March, citing very clearly that Americans with the Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. We must not forget that anti-discriminatory disability legislation applies to all medical healthcare decisions, even in crisis standards of care. Even in, in India, section 3.3 of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act warns against discrimination based on disability. So it is true that those having thoracic disability or those who are elderly they have decreased lung compliance, decreased vital capacity, but we do not have any studies which have proven a direct association between these and poor prognosis when mechanical ventilation is required. For example, in ICUs or in ventilator patients, the triage policies should be based on individualized assessment, based on equity and justice. So the reason why disabled people are becomes more vulnerable is because of attitudinal, environmental and institutional barriers that are reproduced in COVID-19 response. For example, many blind people, deaf and blind people who rely on touch. For them, physical distancing is inherently harder to practice. And the same is true for those who are dependent on caregivers. Moreover, the word social distancing has a different connotation in a geographically diverse country as wide as India, which has had its share of grappling with untouchability amidst socially outcast Dalit and tribal communities, segregation forcing people affected by leprosy to live in leprosoriums, and people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities who were locked in institutions. I personally prefer physical distancing over social distancing to mitigate the attitudinal barrier and to respect 
cultural preferences. We need to be socially connected, but physically distant. We need to ensure that health advisories are accessible through sign language interpretation, captioning, and easy to read format. We need to engage in equitable practices to leave no one behind and provide health for all, including rural areas. India spends only 1.29% of GDP on health. India is a low middle, medium, uh, medium income country where 69% of disabled live in rural areas. Around 2 million families have more than a person with a disability in the household as per the government of India data. Disabled people are less likely to be employed and when employed, they're likely to be in informal sector. Lockdown has further ensured the loss of work and income. Stigma has perpetuated hunger, starvation and deaths. Social protection measures for disabled are inadequately resourced at 0.03% of GDP. The value of the emergency cash transfer, which was initiated by the government of India, it works out to be less than five US dollar per month, which is grossly inadequate. Even this amount covers only 8% of working age adults with disabilities, and this does not include children with disabilities. It should be as per the International Labor Organization's recommendations of $2 per day or $66 per month, which comes out to be 5,000 Indian rupees per month. Pandemics are a period of greater uncertainties that require equally swift action to embed ethics in all decision-making processes. The principle of solidarity justifies efforts to overcome health inequities by protecting the rights of the most marginalized. The emerging field of disability ethics can help policymakers in employing anti-discriminatory approaches to value disabled lives and triage decisions. So that's all I have to say at the moment. Good evening, my name is Mark Barnico and I'm the uh, executive director of the uh, Francis and Rose Yuen campus here in Hong Kong. And um, it's an interesting uh, foundation setting that the doctor panelists have uh, provided for us tonight. Um, we have many questions from the audience and what I wanted to do next was kind of drill into a couple areas, but I didn't wanna leave uh, many of the questions unasked. So I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between drilling down and um, asking questions. And we'll probably have more questions pop up on the screen. The questions that I'm going to be asking the, the doctors uh, had already been sent to us in advance. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Chin. And um, Dr. Chin, what amazes me is this whole idea that uh, we had these initial faulty uh, tests. And I'm wondering to myself, how did this happen? How did the US, you know, the richest country in the world end up um, so unprepared for a situation like this. As the healthcare systems and policy expert on our panel, I was wondering if you could address that, please. Yeah, thanks, Mark. They were the four main causes that I mentioned a little bit earlier. That first, the Centers for Disease Control, which is a great organization and historically has done a great job of creating tests when they are needed. They ended up using a contaminated laboratory to develop their initial tests. So the initial tests didn't work. And so we lost three weeks right there. The private industry, the private laboratories, many were eager to jump in and, and help out, but the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates the private laboratories, had overly restrictive bureaucratic rules that were a great disincentive for the private laboratories to enter the space. And then third, here's an issue where the, the federal government, you, you need to have a national response for the supply chain that you can't rely upon each of the 50 states to, to solve the problem or for the, the private marketplace to be able to rapidly figure out uh, how to fix the supply chain and, and where to m most uh, give the, the tests where they're needed. And so the federal government should have come in in terms of, uh, they have actually have like a, the ability to enact a, a, uh, a regulation that allows them to, to basically direct industries to make more ventilators, make more masks, uh, make more of the supplies needed for COVID-19 testing. And the administration has been 
uh, reluctant to to use that particular power. Then also then earlier, uh, in President Obama's administration, there was an office within the National Security Council whose job was to think all the time about how to prepare for a global pandemic. And that office was dismantled early in the Trump administration. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Huang, uh, you mentioned that there's some creative ways that you've seen that some of the uh, 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 patient care uh, facilities are reorganizing themselves um, to be more effective to combat this virus. Uh, can you, do you have any examples of things that you're seeing, um, best practices that you could share with our global audience tonight? Yes. Um, I think I, I mentioned, I alluded to one of the, uh, one of the strategies, which is to um, basically reorganize um, the space of, of long-term care facilities uh, to basically create um, areas where there are known people with, uh, with the infection and those without. This allows for, um, you know, um, basically staff that are going in to take care of uh, people who are, um, uh, who are infected with COVID-19 to be better prepared, to be dedicated to those patients, and to separate that staff from staff taking care of non-infected patients. So that creates this sort of physical spatial separation uh, of infected people. The other kind of novel things that, um, that you've seen uh, that, that people are certainly introducing is, um, is the use of technology to reach, to reach patients that have to be isolated in their room. So um, many patients have been, older patients have been forced to, you know, use their iPads for the first time, to use different uh, ver technology to um, communicate with family members and with, um, and with staff of the facilities. And I'll, give, I'll end with actually an, another a novel um, approach to, uh, to caring for people in, in these facilities is to actually start to rely on some of the individual patients to take, to do, to monitor, to monitor themselves. So, and this is actually carries over into the community as well. So for example, um, in the case of um, blood pressure control, having patients measure their own blood pressure for diabetes management, actually using technologies like glucometers or continuous glucose monitors to actually have the subject themselves, or the patient themselves collect the data, thus reducing the number of times the staff interacts with them and reducing the use of PPE. So those are sort of novel things that are being deployed right now. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Uh, Dr. Peek, uh, one of the questions from the uh, audience is um, a question about the ongoing effects of the sufferers of loved ones um, who die during this period of time. I was just wondering if you could speak to our audience about um, the suffering that's going on uh, 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 across families, across communities, um, and the stress that it's causing. There's another question that's related to stress and whether that's causing a higher incidence of strokes and heart attacks. And I was wondering, um, since uh, uh, there's a preponderance of that in the African-American community, um, whether there's more of it now during COVID-19. You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, oh yeah, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of embedded questions in there. Um, I'll take the first part just about the impact on loved ones. I think that it's um, the, the, the loss of loved ones is always challenging. I think the coronavirus has compounded that in the fact that the restrictive visiting policies during the hospitalization um, makes that much more challenging. So families are really, for the most part, allowed to visit right near the end of life. Um, and the funeral policies are more restrictive. And so like 10 people can go in at a time and some people just are foregoing funerals altogether and um, waiting for a memorial service later. And I think all of the social cultural rituals that we as a society put in place to help us deal with the grieving process around death have been altered during the pandemic. And I think that that uh, weighs on our collective ability to maintain our mental health during these extra burdens. And um, uh, I think all of our panelists have alluded to different ways in which the coronavirus is impacting seniors' mental health or our, our 
um, mental health just in our day-to-day -day functioning. And certainly um, with the death of a loved one, um, it can, it's certainly impacting the family's mental health in ways that it ordinarily wouldn't be. Um, there is, a, we have seen an increase um, in cardiovascular outcomes um, recently, and we're not exactly sure for all of the reasons that that is. Um, one of the hypotheses is that with the shift um, in ambulatory like there's you know the ambulatory setting has has primarily for the most part been shut down so we're not doing as much in-person care and there's a study that came out of uh ucsf that was saying that racial and ethnic minorities only 36 percent of them are utilizing telehealth and so for those um you know racial and ethnic minorities who are more likely to have cardiovascular disease hypertension diabetes um, they're less likely to be using telehealth. And so those chronic diseases may not be monitored as well and may be putting people at increased risk for strokes and heart attacks. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that we're not seeing them as much in the hospital setting. So people may be having symptoms and staying at home for fear of not wanting to go into the hospital. Um, I'd rather stay at home with chest pain than go in the hospital and die of coronavirus. And so we're, I think we may be there, and there may be multiple causes why we're seeing an uptick. We do know, and then last, we do know that chronic stress um, is associated with um, cardiac inflammation um, and other kinds of markers that put people um, like African Americans at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, I think the time period for the coronavirus has been too short. It's only been a couple of months, um, but certainly um, that, that, that can be additive. Uh, we, ha we, did, we do know, for example, um, that only a 10 point increase in blood pressure can increase your risk for cardiovascular outcomes by 50%. And when we looked at the associations, for example, of community violence um, and health, we saw a 10 point increase in blood pressure. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, data out there to support um, a lot of hypotheses for why we might be seeing some increased cardiovascular outcomes now. Great, thank you. I might come back to the mental health in a bit. Um, but Dr. Singh, um, there was a New York Times article yesterday that talked about um, the fear of the virus being greater than the, 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 the impact of the virus itself on vulnerable populations. Um, do you agree with that? Is that something that you could comment on? You, you alluded to it a bit. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, about three days ago, I was watching a documentary on FDR, President Franklin Roosevelt, which is titled The Wheelchair President. And in that speech, uh, President Roosevelt said that, uh, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And it is very true because there are many deaths which are being caused not only because of the COVID-19 itself, but also because of non-virus factors, which include suicide, which includes deaths due to lockdown in India, lati charge, the police atrocities happening at some places within India, hunger, which is a very common cause, and the migration, etc. So that is a very important, I think, a very important factor which we need to consider that there are multiple issues to this particular pro problem and remaining calm is holds the key because for what people with disabilities specifically uh, like those who are having autism or those who are having psychosocial disabilities or intellectual disabilities it is very difficult to uh, uh, you know uh, implement the strict lockdown measures for this particular category of disabled people. There was one incident in Chandigarh in India where there was an autistic person who went outside and he was beaten by the police because they said that, why are you violating the norms of the lockdown without understanding that he is a person with autism? Similarly, there was a person in Dehradun who, was, who went outside to bought a few groceries, but he came empty handed. The reason for that was that he was a deaf person and he was unable to understand or lip read the police official who was standing outside the grocery because the common problem with the mask is that many deaf people who can lip read, they are unable to lip read because of these masks. 
So there are various issues which can create more fear among the vulnerable population, specifically among the disabled population, because as I said earlier, there are many disabled people who rely on caregivers. And there are many caregivers, for example, in Delhi, who are staying in the nearby bordering areas, suburbs of the Delhi. And they find it very difficult to commute because you know, uh, they have to get those electronic passes, which are not easy to get. So there are so many pros and cons of this whole issues. And that is why we, there is definitely fear about the whole issues, but we need to keep our you know, uh, composure and identify ways by interacting with the community, for example, disabled community in this particular case. Uh, and then we need to sort out these possible avenues to ease and out these tensions. I'd like to stay on the topic of caregivers and um, actually uh, go to Dr. Huang on caregivers because you do specialize in um, older patients and, you know, um, being situated here in Asia, you know, we see a lot of elderly pa pa uh, patients, elderly people uh, who are taken care of by care caregivers and they're surrounded by their family, which is uh, kind of a cultural norm here. Um, we don't have that same uh, cultural infrastructure, if you will, to support elderly people. And I was wondering if Dr. Huang, you could comment on what are we going to do? We're keeping people, you know, out of our country. We're we're keeping them uh, from coming into our country. Some of the uh, uh, those jobs that are available for people uh, to take care of our elderly people, um, you know, we're we're not letting people come in to take them. So I was just wondering, Dr. Huang, if you could comment on that on that point. Right. I think. Uh... So Mark, you're alluding to the fact that in some countries, many caregivers are actually immigrants. Um, and, um, and, um, and because of immigration policies related to COVID-19, some of them cannot, uh, cannot enter the countries. Uh, you know, frankly, in the United States, many of, our, many of our nurses actually come from the Philippines. Um, and um, so it's, it's, first, it's important to say that those who are able to care, who are nursing, providing caregiving right now, there, many of them are under incredible stress, right? So if they are doing caregiving, their jobs are stressful because they're, they're concerned about getting the infection. Some of them have died from the infection, um, it, it, while caregiving is also already quite difficult. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I, 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 I think, um, I'm going to segue a little bit. I think, a lot of these questions uh, we're asking about, uh, uh, which are relate to policy and decision making, they're about the greater tension between the immediate effects of the harms of the of the pandemic, and um, and at the same time the the side effects of any policy decision that we take that we make, the side effects related to, you know, um, people not getting the caregiving they need, right? So if we have a policy for immigration that that prevents people from traveling. We then um, have fewer people to take care of um, some of our vulnerable populations, um, and the calculus of and the balance of that of the of the immediate risks of the pandemic and then the side effects of the policies. The the challenge is that we are gathering the data about what's happening all you know while we're living with the pandemic and dealing with its acute effects at the same time. So. Um, it's hard to be dispassionate and objective about what the best policy should be and to make, and to make sound decisions in that kind of environment. Um, we are probably gonna learn a lot from variation in, across countries and across states and how people responded to uh, how, how we deal with caregivers and how we deal with the most vulnerable populations. I think a really fascinating, really social experiment has really been the one in Sweden where um, they actually did um, purposely um, uh, physical dis physically distance the oldest patients, oldest people in their population, while allowing um, uh, people to interact among um, those who were not older and more vulnerable. Um, in in um, what's what's sort of disheartening though is that the long term care experience is basically consistent <laughs> across every country. Um, so that means that that particular population, the oldest, the sickest, those with dementia, there is something about those settings that, um, and, and that has occurred in Sweden as well. So, um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've answered your question, Mark, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's uh, difficult. We somehow need to provide care. We need to care for people. Somehow maintain physical distancing, as uh, Dr. Singh said. Um, and we have to do it in creative ways. That is the, that I think that's, you know, I, I think 
we can probably go back and relitigate uh, what happened in the early early period of the pandemic, but we have to probably come up with uh, new solutions for how to take care of people going forward. And um, I, I, I think it's going to be some mixture of technology, safe, you know, protective equipment, um, and, um, and, and that's the best I can do right now. Okay, thank you. Um, national policy is something that one of our uh, audience members had asked about, and I was wondering, we'll start with uh, Dr. Chen. If you, if you had uh, one wish, you know, for a, a national policy that the U.S. government could institute um, to help rectify this situation now or prevent um, further pandemics in the future, what, what would that be? And I'm going to go to each one of the panelists and ask them their number one policy change. My number one wish would be for an adequate medical and social service safety net. So no matter who you are, if the worst happens like COVID-19, there is that, that financial and social safety net so you don't decline as, as many people have done. Great. Dr. Huang? I... Uh, I mean, I may be boring, but that's on my wish. That's the, what Dr. Chin described is on my wish list as well. Um, a safety net for health insurance that is frankly separated from your employment. So what we've seen now is that people in the United States, the majority over 50% have health insurance through their work. Well, if you, uh, the, the job, job issue is a separate, uh, separate discussion, but uh, to lose health insurance in the middle of the pandemic because you've lost your job because of the pandemic um, has been a, a, a double whammy, I think, as Dr. Chin has said in, in prior news reports. And, um, and, um, and unfortunately, the safety net system that we uh, rely on, many of them are federally qualified health centers or rural hospitals. These have been um, under threat uh, basically for at least a decade or so. Rural hospitals are closing. Um, so the safety net is very frayed in the United States. So um, strengthening it, sort of dis disconnecting health insurance from employment, these are, these are on the wish list. Great. Thank you. Dr. Peak, um, insurance, or do you have any other uh, policies that you'd like to see enacted? Um, definitely insurance, but since that's already on the table, I would say reinstating the Office for Global Pandemic Planning. Um, the the lack of planning that got us here in the first place cannot be understated. Um, even if everyone had insurance, we would be short on supplies. And everything has, the way that we have had to, the way that we've been able to respond to the pandemic in this country compared to other countries, has been limited by those those factors. And so we have not been as successful as, like you were saying, how did this happen in the United States? Be because of that critical lack of insight and planning on the front end. And so um, when it seems to some like a good idea <laughs> to slash the government, um, and uh, it, it never is um, a good idea to, to think that we don't need to plan for emergencies and to shore up our ability to protect our country in time of need, um, because those times are going to be coming faster um, and, and more severely. And so we've got to have these things back in place because the next pandemic is on its way. Thank you. Dr. Singh, um, can we do that globally? Can we get our global act together? Or is everybody retrenched and gone back into their own nationalist ways? How, how do you view things from, from, from your vantage point in India? Yeah, I think from a perspective from the global south, uh, I personally believe that true universal health coverage will be achieved only when people in the rural areas of the world have equitable access. And that is why my primary wish list with the government of India would be that we need to spend more uh, on, on the health and the more GDP on the health and specifically strengthening the primary health care system in the rural areas because in India villages contribute a much larger population than the urban population. 
Thank you. One of the questions that um, actually this is a question I have because I've been in, re, you know, following the news in the U.S. I know this. There are many instances of um, racism against Asian Asian populations um, in the United States, and I was wondering if that is impacting their uh, that uh, uh, group of people's vulnerability during this COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people in our audience who are from Asia actually uh, are interested in this topic as well. So um, I, I'll open it up to the panel, whoever would like to. I know, uh, Dr. Peek, you kind of specialize in this area. Um, anybody who'd like to take that question? I'll start off, and please everyone sort of join in here, mm -hmm. that uh, in the U.S., as in probably every other country, there is uh, an unfortunate history of, of scapegoating and sometimes blaming the other when there's a problem. We talk about racism, for example, or xenophobia. And in the US in Asian American history, there is a history of, of viewing Asian Americans as not American, um, having exclusionary uh, immigration laws, uh, treating uh, Asian Americans as, as less than human at times. Uh, and at times of, 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 of great stress, such as uh, a recession economically or something like the pandemic, it's a high risk time for all vulnerable populations, all, all minorities. And so initially, initially uh, there was the referring of the coronavirus as the Chinese virus by, by some in the government. Um, and that was, was dangerous. Of, of, of you had then uh, some incidents of, of uh, uh, verbal or physical discrimination or violence against Asian Americans, uh, fear of, of coming out, as you mentioned, Mark. Um, to the person's uh, credit, he then later on at one of the press conferences did say, hey, um, we, 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 we don't have discrimination against anyone. Uh, we specifically called out not having discrimination against Asian Americans. However, actions speak louder than words. And just most recently, I think two days ago, for example, at the, the press conference, there was a, a Chinese American journalist who was asking a question which the president did not like. And he basically told that Chinese American journalist, well, maybe you should ask the, 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 uh, your, your, the Chinese government or the, the Asian governments uh, about that. You know, and the reason was why, why did he single her out for making that remark? So I think there is sort of a, um, a very uh, sharp awareness we have to have of how important words are, terms are uh, in shaping public opinion, public actions. Uh, because it has concrete results in terms of uh, either implicitly in terms of discrimination or outright physical violence. So it's something we have to have strong safeguards against and speak out against. Thank you so much. Um, would anybody else on the panel like to speak to that issue? No, I, uh, I totally agree with Dr. Chen. Um, particularly now when we have a heightened sense of racial violence, and a more a sense that um, a higher tolerance, I think, um, in this country that's been purposely um, cultivated um, within our national discourse um, that um, we have to be vigilant. Um, extra vigilant um, when we see new opportunities um, for scapegoating um, arising that um, when people want to um, pretend that these are, you know, misspeaks or jokes or unintended, that that's not acceptable, that we understand the deeper meaning, um, we, we see the results. We see Charlotte. We, we see the violence that happens when people feel empowered um, to, um, to take what they see on TV coming from our president or others um, and to, to, as a mandate for action. Um, and so I feel like we should have a, an extremely low tolerance um, for hate speech that turns directly into hate crimes. There's a, this really terrible confluence that's going on with the virus and the, in the US and around the world, really. Um, the, the virus and the economies, um, basically the bottoms falling out of all these economies. And the fact that you know, most of the vulnerable populations are these 
low income, essential workers. I know, uh, Dr. Peek, you did talk about this, but is there anything we can do to protect these people? Because these people are on the front lines saving us, mm -hmm. all the rest of us at the end of the day. Um, yes, I would respond to that in two ways. Um, one, I think there's the physical protection as far as making sure that they are as safely protected as our healthcare workers. Um, and you're starting to see now when you go into grocery stores or pharmacies, the plexiglass, the this is six feet, I'm wearing a mask. Um, so some additional, you know, things like that that are in place, um, even though they may not be the kinds of PPE that I'm wearing when I go to the hospital, um, but at least some recognition that the workers need to be more protected. Um, and then there's uh, the economic protection. Um, and what we, uh, this, I see a chat message um, from someone whose dad is a lawyer working with employees. And um, what we've heard on the news um, is that, you know, a lot of the money that's been channeling uh, to sort of help boost the economy is not going, as, as you might imagine, to the right places. So la large checks going to Ruth's Chris um, when it should be going to smaller businesses um, to help the most vulnerable. Um, some of the um, food workers are specifically not getting some of the, uh, the funding. And so the, the plans for helping the economy are not necessarily helping those who are most vulnerable in the economy. And so uh, that's just a double insult. Um, and so we, we need to make sure, you know, the devil's in the details, um, that we're protecting, that we're economically protecting, as well as physically protecting um, those who are protecting us. It's in our self-interest <laughs> to protect the essential workers. So there's a reason that we're calling them essential. Um, and, uh, you know, if we cannot recognize that essential role for them, we need to at least recognize that essential role for us. Thank you. We have a couple other questions you mentioned. Um, one of the questions that's uh, just come in um, is how has private medical sector risen to COVID-19? Does anybody have any experience with the private sector? Um, Again, I'll start in with, with some, some comments. So on, on one hand, I think the frontline health organizations have by and large done a, 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 an excellent job. But in some ways that the closer you get to the people in the front line, there's um, no, no sort of room for, for politics and for, for um, abstract hand waving because you have to deal with the immediate situation. So I think like a lot of the, the, the hospitals, private hospitals and clinics have done you know, a great job of, of organizing and, 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 and planning. On the other hand, I think there were situations where the, the, the private marketplace has, has not worked well. So one example would be like the supply chain, where there's got to be an adequate incentive for uh, private industry to invest in, for example, retooling a factory to make masks uh, with a guarantee of adequate supply to justify the investment in the upfront investment in, in, in um, for example, creating that type of, of um, um, uh, manufacturing capacity. This is where, for example, then the government, the role of government would be to then um, overcome these areas of market failures where, um, because of the lack of incentives, uh, something's got to be done then to ensure there's a supply chain uh, adequately. So that's one example where, again, this is a balance, I think, in the U.S. between um, a, a general belief in the power of the, the, the free market and, and industry. There's a lot of uh, great strength there, but at the same time, there are uh, specific situations or externalities where markets don't work well, where the government has to come in. Otherwise, you have then great inequities and the vulnerable suffering. Great, thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in, and I've been asked to, to kind of address a couple questions that we had uh, uh, before the uh, webinar started. One of the questions is around um, suicide rates and whether we're seeing, you know, a greater preponderance of suicide rates in the vulnerable population itself. Um, is there any particular segment of vulnerable people that are, um, that are experiencing 
that more or more susceptible to it? You know, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have, I don't know. Um, but I would imagine so. Uh, everyone, yeah, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, Monica. Uh, I, I, I think the answer is, um, actually, we, I think we don't know um, yet. Um, I mean, there's certainly anecdotes about uh, suicides in the time of, there, there, and actually there are these high profile anecdotes about murder and suicide in the time of the, um, of the shutdown. But um, I don't know how much of that is attributable to that pandemic. And then we don't know the subpopulations of people who, um, if there is an increase, if, which, which populations um, have experienced it more. We are actually in the middle of, um, I think in prior webinars, you've heard about the National Social Life, Health and Aging Project, um, which is based at the University of Chicago. And so it, we are in the middle of designing data collection to um, around death and morbidity and the COVID-19 experience across, uh, for this national sample. And so we'll know more about the health effects of, um, of the pandemic and its side effects, uh, the side effects of policies from those sort of studies. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know right now if we can say, um, answer your question directly. Okay, great. Um, can I add to that, Mark? Yes, please. Dr. Yes, Singh. we have some sort of a data in India. There was a public interest technologist in Bangalore by the name of TJS GN. So he has curated data coming out from the media reports published in India. And based on that, he has published an open access uh, data directory where they have reported uh, the non-virus deaths from 30th January to till now. So from 30th January to 25th March, when the lockdown started in India, there were 11 non-virus deaths. And from the beginning of the lockdown, that is uh, 25th March to as of today, the total number of deaths, non-virus deaths have been 418. And in that data set, you can actually uh, categorize that based on the type of death, I mean, the section of the society. And there has been 168 suicides among the 418 deaths. So that says it all. I think we are on the verge of a mental pandemic as well. And the next large cause of the death were death of the migrant workers, because in India, there has been reports that they have to travel miles and miles to reach their respective states. There has been many death, many uh, you know accidents attributed to migrants. So that is the second largest data set in that Indian data uh, database. I would be sharing the link of that in the Q and A uh, section so that people who are interested they can have a look at that. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to stay with you, Dr. Singh, and talk a little bit about um, collaboration with other institutions. Um, we know you have a, a strong affiliation with the University of Chicago, um, but with other institutions in Asia, what are you learning? What are you experiencing? How are you sharing? Can you give us a little bit of your experience from that? Well, yes. Uh, one of my reasons to visit the University of Chicago was that to gain knowledge in the clinical medical ethics. And University of Chicago is the pioneer in case of clinical, when it's clinical medical ethics is concerned. And I was the first Indian to do that fellowship. In addition, there are a few, my, few of my colleagues from the China who are there. Because what we believe is that, you know, the ethics committees are, are very robust in the United States. On the contrary, what we need in Asia, specifically in India and China, is that more of these ethics committees to become a part of normal routine consultations, which are not there. We usually discuss these issues once there has been a death. What we need right now is that, for example, in a situation like this, the current pandemic, when there are there is so much of the of of, of you know uh, moral injury on the physicians, what to do? What is the right decision regarding use of ventilators? Whom to give? Whom not to give? What is the ideal scenario? So these are the situations where these ethics committees can help. So I learned a lot from the clinical medical ethics, and the second was my association with the Buxbaum Institute. Uh, with a grant from the Buxbaum Institute, I was able to frame disability competencies for health professions educations. I shared so many examples where uh, inadvertently, you know, uh, doctors don't even know, but there are few subtle biases in their decision makings, which comes up not because they are not educated about that. The main issue is that many of them had no interaction with various types of disabilities or the people having those disabilities. 
And that is why with the help of Bugsman Institute, we frame disability competencies in which we, we cover a very historically neglected sector, which is the voices of the doctors with disabilities. And I think that is important in bridging the health disparities because you need to have the voices from the various vulnerable populations, people from the elderly, people of color, people who are from the poverty background, doctors with disabilities, people from the LGBTQIA plus community. When you hear those voices, when these will come up in, in, in your medical decision making as your colleagues, then I think I believe you will start to see changes happening at the ground level. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, you know, as a university, uh, and this is one of the questions that did come from the audience, um, I'd like to ask uh, two related questions. One is, as the University of Chicago, have we done enough during the pandemic period? Um, could we do more? What, what could we do? And then the second part of that question is, what do we see the role of the university during a period like the one we're experiencing now? I'll start with uh, Dr. Chin. It's a great question. I think there are multiple roles for a university. And I think on, on whole, I have been impressed overall with what the university has done. Uh, one is like thought leadership. And so I think it's wonderful you've been sponsoring this particular webinar and thank you for the opportunity. And I know you've had other opportunities for other webinars. And so on um, these different issues ranging from medical care, basic science discovery, these policy issues, care of the, the vulnerable, uh, these are important to discuss these different issues. A second would be uh, the direct medical care. And uh, again, I think within the, the limitations of the US healthcare system, uh, the University of Chicago, I think, has done a, an outstanding job of taking care then of its patients in organizing its care. I think the caveat there is that, that uh, ultimately for us to do the best job caring for the safety net, the underlying health policy system needs to change so that we have a financial case to basically sustain the types of care and investments that allow uh, the best care for, for all particular populations. Uh, a last thing I mentioned is that there's a critical role for being what we call like an anchor institution. In other words, on the south side of Chicago, the University of Chicago is like the, the, the biggest employer and, and dominant. And so besides the, the academics and the research and direct patient care, is how we either model or don't model um, uh, our actions as an institution, which again, I think overall we've done a, 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 a good job with. So things, for example, of uh, creating um, food delivery programs. And Monica has been, um, Dr. Peek has been uh, one of the leaders in creating a partnership with the uh, Greater Chicago Food uh, Dep Depository, then to uh, work with the university to supply foods for uh, some of the South Side uh, folks who are food insecure, or things like um, hiring in the community and community outreach programs and all. These are all important, specific, concrete ways, or you know, the, the rules and regulations we have for our employees in terms of trying to preserve jobs and not furloughing and all, which again, I think overall so far, the university has done uh, uh, an excellent job with. Thank you so much. Dr. Huang, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um... Dr. Chin summarized the kind of the top line um, categories in which the university can play a big role. And I, I agree with him that I've been quite impressed with the uh, university's response. Um, I would just amplify that I, I think what's exciting is, um, uh, you know, really the solution to the problem partially is gonna be in science and in medicine and, and making discoveries around testing or treatment. And um, in both of those cases, we have scientists that are on the front lines of, for example, developing antibody tests. And we have, uh, we were enrolled in some of the earliest trials of some of the treatments for COVID-19. And so that's, that's the, I think the proper role for, uh, for the University of Chicago as well. Um, I've, kind of another thing that's happening is that we're, I think if we can shape policy and make policy more uh, in, in empiric um, and evidence-based, uh, you know, to in either opening the country or keeping things uh, shut down, those are critical decisions. Um, and so our economists and our policymakers and our, have all actually gathered together actually with epidemiologists as well. Uh, there's some really novel studies around cell phone data about what businesses have highest levels of contact with the, you know, where, where people have a lot of contact with each other um, led by our um, a Dean of, of public, the public policy school. Those are really, uh, those are kind of um, objective data that could be used to help decide what parts of the economy can open and what, what cannot. So um, um, the university is definitely uh, 
it's it, oh the other thing that's been impressive is how much everything's been shifted to thinking about COVID-19 because it's such a historic and devastating event and so we're doing everything we can to try to to um to reverse reverse this or mitigate this great um dr p yes um i would say because of the location of the university of chicago we're on the south side um where we are surrounded by communities that are greater than 95% African-American, low income working class communities that we as an anchor institution have a moral um, obligation to serve our community. And so we have been um, doing so clinically, but we also have um, an obligation to help in, to rise to the challenge of helping to support, as Marshall was saying, as an anchor institution um, in times of great economic crisis to help support our neighbors. Um, and so one of the things that the institution has been doing is to really leaning heavily into the city's racial equity rapid response team to try and help the city think about how we can reduce disparities um, in the coronavirus epidemic within our city. Three of the uh, communities that are suffering most significantly from the coronavirus um, epidemic are communities that are um, primarily black and two of those are on the south side. And so the University of Chicago has been um, partnering with uh, community-based organizations, um, community clinics and community hospitals to try to um, do a lot of things to work in those communities and decrease uh, cases and prevalence. Um, and so that I think is part of our responsibility as well. Great, thank you. And Dr. Singh, I'm gonna give you the last word on what do you think universities uh, could be doing more? I, th I think yes, uh, because there is, a, there is a very great role of medical universities, specifically in, in, in India, because uh, there is no country with more TB patients than in India. And there has been this buzz about that, you know, BCG vaccination offering protection for people in global south against COVID. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have any evidence yet. What is reported in media is a handful of ecological studies, which are not peer reviewed. They are just preprinted with serious uh, methodological flaws. So already I believe Australia, Netherlands, and I think also US, they have already started conducting trials to test this hypothesis. And I think there lies a greater opportunity in medical universities within India, because we need to do more of these randomized control trials within India because here we have maximum number of you know, tuberculosis patients. There is a tuberculosis program running down over there. So because in, in, in India, TB kills more people than COVID-19. So there is a role for medical universities. Thank you so much. Um, you know, when you're running a panel on, uh, with, with medical doctors as contributors, you have to be uh, sensitive to time. And I know it's early there and your phones are, and your texts are probably going off. So I wanna make sure that we try to stay on schedule with. Uh, closing the, the program. But um, I really, uh, you know, one thing that I would like to say is that there's, in preparing for this webinar, I've learned about so many different vulnerable populations um, that, you know, uh, COVID-19 really draw to the, drew to the forefront. So if there's really any kind of silver lining, it's um, putting more attention on these uh, classes of people, these groups of people, um, so that we're more aware. And I think that Hopefully we're gonna be, um, you know, our institutions and our government uh, policymakers are going to be listening to programs like this and be more aware when they're actually making policy to help not only deal with COVID-19, but also uh, to uh, help us become more informed and I think more civil as a society when we're dealing with um, uh, vulnerable populations. So I really want to thank the entire panel tonight um, for your contributions. It's been fantastic. I wish we had more time and maybe we'll take more time in the future. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Buxbaum Institute of Clinical Excellence in Chicago, as well as Aditi and her team uh, in uh, the Delhi Center, uh, Zining and his team in the Beijing Center. And of course, um, our team here, uh, who's been kind of the backbone of the program in terms of delivering uh, uh, this program here at the UN campus in uh, in Hong Kong. So I wanna thank everybody for, for participating. And um, one last thing I'd like to do is mention that um, if you haven't registered, we have another program and it is in the form of a series.
It's called 100 Year Lives in Asia. And uh, actually episode two is tomorrow night. Um, this is uh, uh, hosted with our chairperson, uh, Professor Kate Agney. Um, and tomorrow's episode will be discussing healthcare and life expectancy. Um, this is tomorrow night, 8.30 p.m. Hong Kong time. Uh, we adjusted our time for most of our programs, so people in the U.S. and Europe uh, and throughout Asia could be participating in them. If you'd like to know more about our programs, you can find us at uh, www.uchicago.hongkong/events, and uh, the Delhi Center events are at uchicago.in. The Beijing Center events are at uchicago.cn.beijingcenter. And uh, you can always follow us here in Hong Kong on the University of Chicago UN Campus Facebook page. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much from wherever you dialed in from. Hope to see you again and please stay safe. Good night.